Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Baltimore County Fire Department EMS Academy training series. For those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Berenholtz. I am an anesthesia and ICU physician at Hopkins. I am an active member of Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company in Baltimore County, and I have the honor of serving as one of the associate medical directors for Baltimore County Fire Department. Uh, on behalf of Baltimore County Fire Department, the um, uh, director's office, uh, Dr. Pollock. Uh, I know Dr. Sagel is with us as well. Thanks for joining, Jeff. And on behalf of the EMS office, Chief Shedding, Captain Stewart, Captain Fitzpatrick, thanks for what you guys do every day. Thanks for your dedication to lifelong learning. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Big shout out to Ashley Brooks. Ashley is a young volunteer at Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company. She's helping us run the um, live chat or the Zoom platform. Ashley is also the one who sends out a link in the chat sometime during this presentation. Uh, click on the link, fill out a little bit of information, get your MIM CEU. Now, there is an option at the bottom of the receipt. There's actually a lot of information, some updates I have about CEUs and about MIMS report. So please hang on to the end. Okay, uh, I have I'm some mute, announcements mute, right? about the MIMS CEU process. Uh, many people have asked me for receipts for participation. So I uh, we have developed some stuff like that. So let's uh, uh, table that until the end of the talk uh, though. Uh, so tonight we're super crazy excited and honored to have with us uh, Dr. Alison Margolis. Uh, I, I shared with Dr. Margolis that he is who I want to be when I grow up. Uh, Dr. Margolis is an assistant professor in the Division of Special Operations of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Johns Hopkins University. School of Medicine. He completed residency and fellowship and was a chief resident at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He's currently program director of the EMS fellowship at Hopkins. He continues to work as a medical officer within the Center for Law Enforcement Medicine in Johns Hopkins. He's also the medical director for Johns Hopkins Lifeline Critical Care Transport Program and associate medical director for Howard County Department of Fire and Rescue Service. Dr. Margolis, thanks so much for being with us. We super appreciate you. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for that great introduction, Dr. Baron Holtz. Um, you know, I I tell everybody that uh, I hope to be you when I when I grow up. Um, you you are a mentor for us all, so I was very very uh, fortunate when you asked me to to present here tonight. So thank you for doing so, and I I hope this is uh, um, going to be great for everybody. So let's get started. You know, th this is a topic that I am super passionate about. I love LVADs. Uh, hopefully, after uh, this discussion, you will all love LVADs more than you do now. Um, LVADs are often a thing that tend to give us um, a lot of angst and anxiety when uh, we see patients with them. And I'm hoping to sort of distill LVAD patients down to some very basic facts that will allow you to manage a patient with an LVAD, even if they're potentially crashing in front of you. So the uh, title of the talk this evening, The Crashing LVAD Patient, how to keep your pulse when your patient doesn't have one. Um, I do have the chat up. That doesn't always mean I'm going to see what you write. Uh, feel free to interrupt me. I don't want this just to be me talking at you. If you have questions, feel free to chime in, put them in the chat, and I will try to get to them uh, along the way. And if I don't, we'll have time at the end for some questions and discussion. All right. So uh, CME stuff, disclosures, none. Uh, disclaimer. So again, remember what I present here is not totally comprehensive. Uh, hopefully you will go back and read about LVADs uh, and continue to refresh your memory throughout your EMS career. Um, what I talk about today should not supersede the recommendations of your own EMS agency uh, and your medical director. Um, and then in general, uh, the answer to everything with an LVAD patient is it's always best done in conjunction with the uh, LVAD team. Uh, or coordinator, whoever takes care of that patient. Um, you're going to see toward the end of this talk, I'm going to make reference to an upcoming MIMS protocol that we wrote about LVADs. Um, and within that protocol is actually going to be numbers that you can easily reference for the LVAD coordinator at Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland, and at MedStar. So that should be readily available to you uh, to help you manage these patients. All right, so what are we going to cover today? We're going to go over some learning objectives and we're going to talk about our LVAD parameters that are important to know when taking care of a patient with a VAD, discuss some basic principles that are also necessary to have a good understanding of. So when things go wrong, you understand what sort of the basic approach to these patients is. We're going to discuss uh, a few cases 
in fact, were to do four cases uh, that illustrate some important LVAD emergencies and to discuss a couple of the key management principles behind those cases, and then, of course, summarize with some key points at the end. Okay, so if you like learning objectives in this format, again, we're going to review some of the parameters and how they function, discuss key principles of LVAD physiology, and then again, uh, four life-threatening complications in the approach to management with these individuals. All right, so, you know, in order to understand sort of the rest of this discussion in this lecture, it's important to understand how the LVADs actually function. And to do that, you have to understand a little bit of history. So the history part is there used to be these devices that we sort of refer to as the first generation LVAD devices that were known as pulsatile flow devices. And they had basically a motor or a piston that generated an up, down, up, down uh, flow that essentially augmented systolic and diastolic flow or augmented the own native heart pulsatility. And because they did augmentation of systolic and diastolic flow, you were able to put a blood pressure cuff on these people and measure a blood pressure like you would normally do. And this is what it looks like, this initial generation. So it has this sort of motor that would go up and down, up and down, take blood in, and then shoot it out the other end. Well, these don't exist anymore, okay? The pulsatile flow LVAD devices do not exist anymore. They are fraught with complications. Their life expectancy was not that long. Um, and we've essentially moved on to what we call continuous flow devices. And all of the LVADs that you're going to see, and we'll discuss the three sort of main types that are out there, but all of those are going to be continuous flow LVADs. And what is a continuous flow LVAD? Well, they basically have a motor, or in other words, an impeller that generates continuous flow. And in doing so, that is what generates that humming sound that you hear when you auscultate over the chest of a patient with an LVAD. And because of the continuous flow, generally patients lose pulsatility. And because they don't have systolic and diastolic flow and they lose pulsatility, you can't measure a blood pressure like you normally do. So what we have to do with these patients is we get a MAP or a mean arterial pressure. And the way we do that ideally is to put a blood pressure cuff on the patient and then place a Doppler over the brachial artery and listen for when you hear that sound. And that is written down as the patient's map, right? So this shows blood now coming in from the left ventricle, this impeller or motor constantly spinning and then bringing blood out to the aorta. And what this does is it helps the heart function. It helps give blood flow to the rest of the body. And in doing so, again, you lose that pulsatility and you can't measure the blood pressure like you normally do, you have to obtain a map. So what happens if you don't have a Doppler? Well, we could use an automated blood pressure cuff. And generally speaking, the maps that we get there should be a good approximation for what you get when you obtain it via a Doppler. But obtaining it via Doppler is really the gold standard if you need to know that. So, we have come a long way, right? So initially in 2001, you had this first generation heart mate uh, that was approved by the FDA. And again, this was that pulsatile device. Since then, these have been phased out and now you have the continuous flow devices. And the heart mate is one group of those. And you have the heart mate two and the heart mate three. The heart mate two was approved in 2008 and the heart mate three was approved back in 2017. Uh, the majority of the LVADs we are now seeing is, are going to be the HeartMate 3 because they actually have a little bit of a longer uh, life expectancy than does the HeartMate 2. In a little bit, I'll get into one other sort of category of LVADs. So there's a question in the chat that said, what, is, what exactly is a Doppler? So it's a great question. So a Doppler is basically a device that allows you to listen to flow. Um, and you turn it on and you put a little bit of acoustic jelly at the end of it. And if you place it over an artery, you should hear the whooshing sound of the blood flow going through the artery. And when you pump up the blood pressure cuff, you're going to occlude blood flow through that artery until you release it to a point where the blood flow now starts to come again. 
and you start to hear the blood flow coming through using the Doppler or the sound that the Doppler picks up is what you're listening for. All right. So do you think that on. we could get some assemblance with our stethoscope in the field? Uh, probably, probably not, unless you have one of those crazy acoustic ones that, uh, you know, cost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars, uh, likely not. You're probably not going to hear much of anything. Great question. So this is what the HeartMate LVADs look like. The picture on the top is what the HeartMate 2 looks like, and the picture on the bottom is what the HeartMate 3 looks like. And again, this gives you a pictorial representation of exactly how an LVAD functions. So it is essentially coming from the patient's left ventricle. And that motor pulls blood from the left ventricle and essentially gives it back to the aorta. And from the aorta, it can now pump to the rest of the body. Remember, before this LVAD was put in, the patient's individual heart function was about 10 to 15%. And that's generous, right? So how well do you think a heart that's, effective, that's effectively pumping at 10% is able to give blood flow to the rest of the body and perfuse the organs? Not very well. And the patient's quality of life is extremely poor. And remember, there's a category of these patients that ultimately are going to need a heart transplant. And nobody really wants to transplant a patient who is a very poor candidate because they have other organ issues from seeing a real lack of blood flow over a period of time. So by putting this device in, it's gonna help give normal blood flow to the rest of the body to help those organs perfuse and essentially recover and allow the patient to really get into tip top shape before their transplant. The only difference really between the HeartMate 3 is where it's implanted. So you see this HeartMate 3 here is implanted right within the pericardial space uh, versus the motor here is actually the heart mate two below the person's diaphragm. So in terms of, of how it's actually implanted, there is a difference, but in terms of how it functions, it's really gonna be the same thing. Again, pulling blood from the left ventricle, putting it back to the aorta, helping the heart distribute blood flow to the rest of the body. So what is the patient going to look like when you guys see them and pick them up in your department, uh, pick them up at their, at their house and bring them to an emergency department? Well, something like this, right? So they're going to have what we call a system controller, which is one of these things here that they're usually wearing. And they have three leads coming out of it, okay? One is what we call the drive line. And the drive line is connecting the system controller, which you could think of as the brains of the actual device. And it tells the device how quickly it should be spinning. And it gives that message through this drive line, in essence, through the patient's skin to the actual motor itself. Okay. So the drive line here connects the brains of the operation, the system controller, to the actual motor. The other cords or the other leads are going to be for the batteries. And the patient should really be wearing two batteries. Now, when we transport them to the hospital, we always want to make sure they're taking their backup batteries. This is critically important, especially if they're being transported to a non-LVAD center, because non-LVAD centers are not always going to have spare batteries. So if the patient is in a non-LVAD center for an unrelated issue to their LVAD, and they start to run out of their battery, that's a big problem, right? So we need to always make sure you are taking extra batteries and their entire pack with them. I want to get a little bit into some of the LVAD parameters because understanding what normal LVAD parameters are will help you understand when something goes wrong. Now, do I expect you to memorize the LVAD parameters of a HeartMate 2 or a HeartMate 3 patient? No, I don't because the patient themselves and their care partner are very, very knowledgeable with respect to these devices. And even if let's say the, the patient may be unconscious or obtunded or to a point where they can't really give you great information, their care partner will be able to. So with that said, I still wanna go over some of the normal parameters. So if you compare the HeartMate 2 and the HeartMate 3, you'll see there are four parameters that are displayed on the actual system controller. And I will show you what it looks like when you see the patient in a, in a minute. 
of those four, three are pretty much the same, right? Between the heart mate three and heart mate two. The pump flow is about the same. The pulse index is about the same. And the power is about the same. What differs between the two devices, as you can see on the screen, is the pump speed. So let's take each one individually for a moment to make sure that you understand. The pump speed. So this is essentially how fast that motor is spinning. So for the heart mate two, the normal pump speed is around 9,000 RPM. It's mind boggling when you think about it, but this little motor is spinning 9,000 RPM. And it does so in order to generate a flow or in essence, the pump flow. And the pump flow, whether or not it's the HeartMate 2 or the HeartMate 3 is around four to five liters per minute. And for those of you that are thinking, wow, that number sounds pretty familiar, four or five liters per minute. I know that from somewhere. Well, that's the number of what a normal cardiac output should be in a patient. So what this device tries to do is approximate one's normal cardiac output. So again, for the heart mate two, it needs to run at a speed of around 9,000 RPM to draw a pump flow of about four or five liters per minute. For the heart mate three, this doesn't have to spin as fast, right? It spins at about 5,000 RPM to generate still a pump flow of about four to five liters per minute. So again, understanding the speed difference is important because if now you're looking at a, you know, a heart mate three, and the speed is 5,000, that's fine. But if the patient has a heart mate too and the speed is like four or 5,000, that can be a problem. All right, so how does it actually run that quickly? Well, it needs to use power, right? And that's essentially what the pump power is. And the units for power is watts. So it draws about five uh, to six or maybe even three or four, depending. Uh, watts of power essentially from the battery to run this motor at either 5,000 or 9,000 RPM, depending on which device they have, to generate the pump appropriate flow of about four to five liters per minute. Okay. And, and then the pulse index we'll, we'll get into in a minute. So pump speed is going to differ between the devices, but pump flow is again going to be about four or five liters per minute. And pump power is anywhere from three to four to five, even six watts. So again, when you see them, they're going to have this system controller, right? They're wearing this. And you could actually toggle through this using this button here. You can see this button right here to basically toggle through the screen and look at all of their parameters. So again, this patient has a heart rate too. Their pump speed is about 9,000 RPM. Bingo, we're good. This person has a heart mate three, their pump speed is about 5,000 RPM, bingo, we're good, okay? And pressing that button or having the patient or their caregiver, if you're uncomfortable doing so, pressing that button will allow you to see what their different parameters are, including their flow and their power, and will also show you if there are any alarms, something that is important, which we will get to in a bit. As I mentioned, there is another um, category or type of LVADs, and this is the hardware device. So we just spoke about the HeartMate, of which you have the HeartMate 2 and HeartMate 3. Now you have the hardware HVAD. And the hardware HVAD looks very similar to the HeartMate 3, okay? Again, the main difference in, in terms of parameters is, was that speed. So you can see on the screen, the speed here is about 2,800 RPM. So if you want to kind of remember, the hardware HVAD, 3,000 RPM. The HeartMate 3, 5,000 RPM. The HeartMate 2, 9,000 RPM. Everything else should be about similar. All right, there, there are a few questions. Let me take a look. Uh, what RPM should we be looking for when treating an adult versus adolescent? Good, good, good question. So again, um, you know, they're, they're going to be about the same um, no matter what the num what the patient is, no matter who they are, my recommendation is always ask the patient what their normal numbers are or ask the caregiver or care provider. 
um, that is going to give you the most accurate information about where they should be. Because there are some patients that have been adjusted um, by their VAD team for whatever reason. So to give you the most reliable response, uh, whether it's you know an adult or a pediatric patient, ask the patient or ask their care partner what their normals currently are. Um, could a high RPM with a low flow indicate a clot or a blockage? Good question. Uh, that may be answered in a little bit, so we're going to hold off, but thank you for asking that question. Uh, this is just another example of how that HVAD looks. So again, it's implanted within that left ventricle, within the pericardial space, drawing blood from the left ventricle, putting it back to the aorta, and getting the blood out to the rest of the body. So that fourth parameter that I talked about is that pulsatility index or that flow pulsatility. And this, I would say, of the four parameters, I would say would be least important for you to necessarily memorize or have to look at. But for completeness sake, I think it's still important to go over so you have some understanding of what it is. So you can think of the pulsatility index or the flow pulsatility as being proportional to how much work that patient's left ventricle is doing. Or in other words, it, it's a surrogate or a marker that reflects the patient's own or native heart function. And when you think about pulsatility index, I want you to remember the number two liters per minute. Okay. So typically, your pulsatility index ranges from three to seven liters per minute. Lower values reflect less heart function from the patient, less native heart function and more reliance on the pump. Higher values reflect greater native heart function. So that person's heart is doing a little bit better on their own and therefore requires less support by the pump. Now the pulsatility is the difference between the peak here and the trough, okay? And remember how I said, remember the number two? Well, that pulsatility, the difference between the peak and the trough, that number should always be greater than two liters per minute. And the trough itself should always be above two liters per minute. And I will show you an example of that in a little bit. Uh, again, so this is a picture of where the hardware HVAD sits within that pericardial space. For those of you that like x-rays or want to know what it looks like, we take a chest x-ray in the hospital. So this shows the difference between that heart mate two that we can see here with that axial impeller is implanted below the patient's diaphragm. And this is an example of the HVAD. Um, again, this has more of a centrifugal impeller that's implanted right within the pericardial space. Um, pop quiz for anybody. Uh, who likes looking at x-rays, so what do we see here? Well, no, they didn't forget to take out one LVAD when they put the other one in. This is actually an example we call a BIVAD. So this person has an LVAD and an RVAD. Pretty interesting. So what constitutes how much work the patient's own heart does as opposed to the LVAD or HVAD? Uh, so good question. Um, I will handle that one toward the end. Won't forget about it. If I do, please remind me again. All right, let's get into some indications. So why do people have these LVADs? So the two main reasons are one, bridge to transplant, right? So as you probably know, um, hearts are not readily available, right? We don't have an overabundance of heart donors. So there are many people out there that require a heart transplant, but there's not a compatible match for them. So again, in order to continue to essentially live and rehab in essence, when that heart is available, they can really do well and an LVAD device is put in to bridge them until their heart is ready. The other reason is what we call destination therapy. So this is when a patient is determined to be ineligible for a transplant, based on a number of criteria, or the patient themselves says, you know what, I don't want to go through it. I don't want the surgery. I don't want to be on immunosuppressants for the rest of my life. 
I'm just going to be with the LVAD. And this is known now as a permanent device, and the patient will effectively live out the rest of their years with the LVAD. I put this up not as a example of what you need to necessarily memorize, but as an example of all of the criteria that a patient needs to meet in order to even get an LDAT. So they gotta be really sick, right? They can't really be able to walk a block at all. And they have to have failed a lot of other medical management that we do for them to try to get their heart functioning. Another way I want you to think about these patients is that they're sick, right? They're clearly sick. Their heart function is probably about 10%, but they're not too sick. So what do I mean by that? That's a weird statement. So what I mean by that is that they really need to have adequate right heart function. So if both sides of their heart are really, really, really weak and their right heart is failing miserably as well, if you put one of these devices in the patient, they're gonna bring back a ton of blood back to the right side of their heart, which normally help them, okay? But if they have a really sick right side of their heart, then that right side of the heart's not gonna be able to handle all that blood. They won't be able to get it through to the left side of the heart and out to the body, and the patients will go into heart failure even more pronounced than they're already in. So the, another reason why that's important is if a patient starts to acutely decompensate one of the things you need to consider is something happened to their right heart. In particular, they had an MI that affects their right heart. They've had a PE that's now affecting their right heart. Um, so again, acute decompensation, consider things that are affecting the person's right heart. And we'll get into a little bit more of that in a minute. All right, some really, really important basic principles I want you guys to understand and remember. One, Again, these are continuous flow devices. We already said that. Why is that important? Because again, you got to get a mean arterial pressure, ideally with a Doppler, but if not, put on the automated cuff and record what the map is. Number two, and really important for us in the pre-hospital environment, these patients are pre-load dependent. Well, what does that fancy word mean? So pre-load really reflects the amount of volume, the amount of blood in the right side of the heart. Why is that important? Because we know the right side of the heart pumps blood ultimately to the lungs and to the left side of the heart and out to the rest of the body. And you would think that these patients, you know, have CHF all the time, right? They usually have too much volume because their heart function is only 10%. And oh my God, we can't give them any fluid whatsoever. However, when you put an LVAD device in these patients, it helps the people essentially get back to normal heart function. So really, they do need fluid. They do need to stay hydrated the way a normal person does. And if they get dehydrated or they're bleeding, then they're going to lose volume. And if they lose volume, their device becomes unhappy. And we will see what that looks like in a little bit. So in addition to being preload dependent and needing a certain amount of blood and a certain amount of volume, they are afterload sensitive. So what does the word afterload mean? Well, afterload is defined as the amount of pressure that the heart must pump against to get blood out of the aorta into the rest of the body. And that is really defined essentially based on one's blood pressure, but again, specifically for LVAD patients, their mean arterial pressure. So what is the mean arterial pressure for an LVAD patient? Somewhere between 70 and 90. And patients that have a mean arterial blood pressure of let's say 100 or 110, they're going to have too much afterload. So what do you think is going to happen when that heart and that LVAD tries to pump blood out of the aorta when their blood pressure is really, really, really high? Well, they're not going to be able to generate enough force to get it out and blood is going to back up and they're going to have heart failure symptoms. So having blood pressure that is too high is also not good for these patients. Okay, We in the pre-hospital environment are not going to intervene on that. Right? We're going to intervene upon that once they get to the emergency department, but that is still something important to make note of if you see when you're caring for these patients. Additionally, um, these patients are both on anticoagulation therapy with Coumadin and antiplatelet therapy with aspirin. So obviously, you're probably thinking to yourself right now, 
they're at very, very, very high risk of bleeding, even with minor trauma. So these, to me, would be those category delta patients in our trauma triage algorithm, right? Let's say they have some sort of trauma injury. They have a fall, right? Fall from standing, and, and they hit their head, but their GCS is fine, and, and the mechanism wasn't significant, and their vital signs look good, and they're not an Alpha, Bravo, or Charlie, but they're maybe a delta, right? This would be sort of provider preference let me take these individuals to a trauma center because they are at very high risk for bleeding, particularly CNS bleeding, so in their brain, but also GI bleeding, okay? So one thing you wanna ask these patients about when you pick them up is, are they having any bleeding symptoms in their stools? So are their stools black or tarry, which could be evidence of, of GI bleeding. When it comes to defibrillation and cardioversion, the question always comes up, can I shock these people if they're in arrest? Can I cardiovert them if they're unstable tachycardia? And the answer to that is absolutely you can and you should. Now, a little bit more controversial, what about CPR? Can I do CPR in these patients? Well, if you look at the manufacturer guideline, generally they say, no, 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 we don't want you doing CPR. You could dislodge the device. Well, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more and you're gonna see there are situations where yes, you should do CPR in these patients if they are in fact in cardiac arrest. And we'll sort of get into that in a little bit more detail in a bit. All right, I promise you clinical cases, let's get into them. So your first patient, 62 year old male with a past medical history, including hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, they had an MI. And now because of that, they have heart failure with a poor ejection fraction that's about 10%. And because of that, they failed a bunch of medical management, and now they have a HeartMate 3 LVAP. You are called to their house. Why? Because acute onset of lightheadedness and shortness of breath. In the setting of about two days of vomiting and diarrhea, and they're not drinking anything at all. Hmm. You remember from this lecture that if patients get dehydrated, that's not good because they are pre-load dependent. They need a certain amount of volume. All right, you already think of that, that's great. What do you do with your patient? You examine them, right? Let's get a set of vitals. So you go to feel for a radial pulse and remember, mm, I can't get one, right? This patient's not pulsatile. Now, there is a caveat that I want you to think about. Some of these HeartMate 3 patients, you will get a pulse because a HeartMate 3 is unique that it itself based on the design of the device, can actually generate pulsatility every two seconds. So that is built in. The reason why they do that, the reason why the device does that is because that pulsatility that the device generates itself helps decrease the formation of clots, which is a big problem with these devices. So if you're only getting a pulse every two seconds, well, that's not the patient's normal pulse. That's a pulse generated from the device itself. So here you're like, I don't know. I don't know what the heart rate is. Either I can't feel one radially or I'm getting one every two seconds. And I know with this heart made three, that's not correlating with the patient's own heart rate. Okay. So your partner is getting the monitor on the patient while they're doing that. You're cycling the blood pressure cuff. And you get a map, map of 50. Like, uh-oh, that's not good. The normal map should be between 70 and 90. All right. The respiratory rate is 26. They're tachypneic. At least they're satting 96% for now in room air and they're afebrile. Okay, you continue to examine your patient and looking specifically at the cardiovascular system, you auscultate and you hear the motor. Awesome, that's good. You look at their JVD, right? And their jugular venous pressure, it's flat. They don't have this bounding JVD, okay? They have really no palpable pulses whatsoever that you're able to feel, okay? Not necessarily surprising and their lower extremities are cool. Well, we don't like when people have cool lower extremities. That means they're not perfusing well. And they have a little bit of edema, but that's pretty much normal for them based on what, they're, well, based on what they say and what their caregiver says. Okay, so now we've examined our patient, we got in a history, let's look at the device. So the LVAD, you start to look at it and the patient says, you know what? I'm having a low flow alarm. And in fact, my flow is about 1.9 liters per minute, and my speed is 3,000 RPM. You're like, all right, shoot. You have a heart rate three. Let me ask, what are your normal parameters again? And they tell you, 
these are my normal parameters. My flow should be about five, my speed should be about 5,000, and my power should be about 3.5. So you could already see that they're having really low flow. And a cardiac output of 1.9 liters per minute is not good for the patient. All right. So about this time, your patient, your patient, your, uh, your partner, and probably your patient too, taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, look at the monitor. And that's what you see. So you're all probably saying, uh-oh, right? So this is VTAC. And the first thing, obviously, you figure out with VTAC is they have a pulse or they don't have a pulse. But this person has a pulse, right? He's, he's talking to you, OK? So uh, what do I do? Well, let's put this together. So one, what is the volume status of the patient? They are hypovolemic, right? The history tells you that. The physical exam tells you that. And because of that, they're hypoperfusing. They have low perfusion. Their MAP is low, and they are cool, OK? What's their heart rhythm? Ventricular tachycardia, OK? You always look at the drive line, right? Make sure the drive line at least looks okay. That's fine, it's intact. The pump speed, 3000 RPM. It's lower than it should be. And for sure, they have a low flow alarm because their flow is really low and it tells you right there, boom, low flow alarm. So putting this together, a hypovolemic patient who's hypoperfusing, who now has ventricular tachycardia with low pump speed and low flow alarms, Putting this together, this is what we call and defines a suction event. And this is what it's going to look like on the patient's monitor. OK, well, what the heck is a suction event, and, and what am I supposed to do about it? Well, so a suction event is essentially when the pump speed is higher than the available circulating volume, right? So this pump is running but there's no volume in the patient to allow it to push through the system. And this is a cool picture of an echocardiogram. And what you can see here is this device is sucked up against the patient's intraventricular septum. And when it does that, it makes the heart very, very unhappy. And it basically sends it into an arrhythmia like ventricular tachycardia. So what are you gonna see looking at the LVAD where you're gonna see a decrease in speed and a decrease in flow? All right, fine. What do you see with the patient? Well, volume status is key, right? They're going to be volume down on exam. The other thing, again, for those that are doing interfacility transport, that may be part of this group listening, you always want to take a look at that chest x ray before you leave that outlying hospital and say, is the cannula look like it's in the right spot? And if they're able, if the if the physician at the outside hospital is able to evaluate the person's heart function and look for a picture like here on the echo to see where that cannula is sitting, that may give you additional information that this cannula is now sucked up against the septum and causing that arrhythmia because there is such a decrease in the amount of volume for the patient. I promised you we'd look again back at that pulsatility and remember what I said about the rules of two. So this is what a normal or full left ventricle looks like up here. Right, the trough is above two and the difference is greater than two. When you have an empty left ventricle, like our patient here, because they've been vomiting, having diarrhea, and not drinking, a couple of things are happening. One, the trough is below two and the difference is less than two. And that tells you that their left ventricle is empty and that is a problem. So, what are some causes of suction event? Well, as in the case of our patient, dehydration, vomiting, and diarrhea. Hemorrhage can also be. So let's say they have a GI bleed and they're bleeding. Well, that's volume two. A lot of these patients are on diuretics, right? So we, they're on Lasix and other diuretics to help keep their volume appropriate. And let's say they are taking more of their diuretic than they should be and they're peeing more than they should be. That can dehydrate them. Remember what I said about issues with the right heart. If all of a sudden the right heart stops functioning appropriately because they have a pulmonary embolism, or they've had a, a right ventricular infarct. Now their right heart isn't pumping. It's not pumping blood to the left side. If blood isn't coming, getting to the left side, there's less volume in the heart to get back to the right side. Um, and then if there is a cannula obstruction, so now 
the inflow cannula gets obstructed and it can't let blood through, well, blood's not gonna get back to the right side of the heart. And again, the patient is gonna be, have low preload and that cannula is gonna get sucked up against the septum. So what is your plan pre-hospitally? Well, the thing that's really gonna fix this is hydration, right? Remember, they are preload dependent, they need hydration you're going to give them volume. And you're gonna start with a 500 cc fluid bolus and you're gonna repeat that, provided there's no evidence of volume overload when you listen to their lungs, okay? Now, can you start an antiarrhythmic medication and cardiovert this patient? Sure you can, absolutely. If they're an unstable tachycardia, you can absolutely cardiovert them. But the chances of them getting back into a normal sinus rhythm are not gonna be very good because you haven't fixed the underlying problem which is that cannula sucked up against the septum because the patient is essentially dehydrated. So this is actually a life-threatening event that we can directly affect and do something about in the pre-hospital environment. You can recognize it and start to give them some volume. All right, let's move on to another case. Oh, I should mention, so Ultimately, like I said, you know, the reason for this is that the pump speed is higher than the amount of volume in the patient. So when they get to the ER and they get to one of the VAD centers and the VAD T comes down, they can actually go in and decrease the patient's speed. So now the speed of the motor is more in line with how much volume the patient actually has. But again, we don't do that. We don't touch it. We don't touch the device. We start with fluid resuscitation and we transport them to a VAD center. All right, this poor patient survived their suction event, but they have bad luck again, they call you back to their house. This time, been short of breath for two days, and he also mentions he's been having dark urine for about a week, Coca-Cola colored urine. Interesting, okay. You examine your patient, you got a heart rate of 120, not terrible. You have a MAP of 64, okay, lower than it should be, right? MAP should be between 70 and 90, but not as low as 50. Um, they're tachypnic again and has an O2 sap, that's okay, and afebrile. So here, when you examine the patient, you hear the motor, good, but here the JVD is a little bit elevated and they have some crackles. And again, they have cool extremities with some edema. So like the patient we saw before, who was dehydrated or volume down, this patient is a little bit different. They have some jugular venous distension. They have some crackle in their lungs. So this tells me that something is going on with how well the pump is functioning. Otherwise, they really shouldn't be demonstrating signs of volume overload. All right, let's look at the device. Oh, uh, crap. Here we go again. We have another low flow alarm. And the flow here is two liters per minute. Their speed is 4,000 RPM and their power is 17 watts. Holy cow, 17 watts. Well, I don't really remember what normal should be. I do remember 17 is probably not normal for their power. You ask them and they say, you know what? Here are my normals. Five for a flow, 5,000 for a speed, and a power of about three to four. Certainly not 17. And they tell you over the last week or so, they've been having these power surges. It goes up and it comes down a little bit and it goes up and it comes down a little bit. And now it's just power surging to 17 watts and the flow is going down. Uh, I see a question in the chat that says, what would be a normal EKG rhythm for a patient with an LVAD? So great question. So the LVAD device itself is not going to affect what the patient's rhythm is. So that is different than when a patient has a pacemaker. Right, and a permanent pacemaker will change what the morphology of the patient's rhythm looks like. And LVAD itself actually doesn't change what the patient's rhythm looks like. So it'll look the same whether the patient does or does not have an LVAD. All right, so again, power surges at low flow. So what do you do? Well, let's recap. Volume status, up. Perfusion, poor. Rhythm, here their sinus tachycardia. Drive line looks okay. Power surges, greater than 17 watts, big problem. And now again, we have a low flow alarm. 
So this is the second reason or second time we've seen a low flow alarm. Before is because they didn't have enough volume. Here, it's suggesting something going on that's requiring the pump to generate and suck more power in order to continue to do what it wants to do, but it can't do it and is having low flow. So my friend over here in the chat that asked a really good question, who was that? Uh, Mr. Johns. So could high RPM with a low flow indicate a clot or a blockage? Well, congratulations, you got the second case. So this is what we call a pump thrombosis. So this is what a big clot looks like sitting in somebody's motor. Obviously this patient didn't do well because it's supposed to be in them, not outside of them. Um, but this is what happens when somebody develops a clot. So what are you gonna see? Well, with respect to the LVAD, they're gonna have high power, low flow, and if, the, and if the drag on that motor is enough because of that clot, eventually you're gonna see the speed decrease as well. In terms of the patient assessment, you wanna ask them about signs of hemolysis. So when this patient was telling you he had black or Coca-Cola colored urine, the reason is because the clot is being sort of chopped up by the motor and the byproduct of splitting up the hemoglobin will cause dark colored urine. Of course, you always want to listen to make sure you still hear the device and you want to assess the patient for any evidence of heart failure symptoms to suggest the device isn't working properly. The take home point with pump thrombosis is right here. You want to ask about trends over days. Any power surge greater than two watts above their baseline is bad news. And the patient should never, ever, ever have double digit power readings. So in the out-of-hospital environment, we put them on the monitor, we do a 12 lead, we listen, we make sure to bring all of our batteries. If the patient is hypotensive, we consult through the base station to see if we can start hemodynamic support, for example, like epinephrine. And of course, we call the VAD team to discuss this with them as well. Once they arrive in the hospital, and we highly suspect pump thrombosis, but we need to start them on anticoagulation. And that comes in the form of heparin. If the patient is really, really sick, then we start to get into a discussion of giving a clot buster, like a TPA type of thing, to break up the clot. Ultimately, if none of that works, the definitive management is replacing the pump, but that comes at a, at a very high cost to the patient's own health, because these are, these are not e easy surgeries to do in a patient that is otherwise not well. So what happens now all of a sudden if the pump stops? It shuts off because that could happen with some of these large clots. So first of all, make sure that it's not for another reason that you forgot to pay attention to the LVAD. So for example, make sure the batteries are connected, none of the cords are loose, and it's connected to a power supply. And then if you checked all of that and that's not the case, well, don't forget about your patient here either, right? At this point, they just become another patient with really bad heart failure. So do they need IV fluids? Likely not in this case, but what about vasopressor support if they're hypotensive? Maybe. And for the people that do interfacility transport, this would be an opportunity to call and discuss whether or not they need inotropic support. So for example, dobutamine to help their heart pump more so on its own because now it completely has lost the help of the device itself. All right. In the remaining uh, few minutes, we're gonna cover the last two cases and then summarize. So again, our unfortunate friend calls us back to the house. Now he has drive line irritation. For the last five days, he has fevers and chills and he's weak and he's lightheaded. And you examine the patient and his heart rate is 120 and his math is 60, okay, a little bit on the low normal side and he's febrile. On exam of the patient, you hear the motor, his lungs are clear, and again, he has coolish extremities, but no edema. His parameters actually look okay in this case. So his flow is pretty good, he has no alarms, the speed's fine, his power's okay. If you don't remember, you ask the patient, and it looks like he compares pretty well. All right, so what is this one? So here, we have a volume patient that is, again, a little bit hypovolemic, right? Their blood pressure is a little bit on the lower side. There's causing them to perfuse a little bit more poorly. The rhythm is sinus tachycardia. Now you go back and you look at that drive line, you see red 
and red skin and drainage from around the drive line. That is not supposed to happen. Now you're thinking, boy, the patient's febrile and they have all this drainage from their drive line. They're probably septic, now resulting in distributive or septic shock. And any alarms? Well, not yet. But if we don't start to resuscitate this patient that has sepsis, they may end up developing another example of a low flow alarm because they start to lose their volume due to sepsis. So this is what we call a drive line infection. Now the drive line is known as the Achilles heel of the device because if something is gonna go wrong, it's usually with the drive line, either malfunctioning or getting an infection. And when we think with it, when we talk about a drive line infection, it's really a continuum or a spectrum. Initially, if we can isolate it to the drive line, we just give the patient antibiotics. However, if this progresses, ultimately, that infection is now going to form a, like an abscess or a pocket around the device, and that will need to be essentially washed out or irrigated. Now, if that's not dealt with appropriately, they're going to need to have the device removed itself, which is, of course, not what we want to do. So how do we manage these patients? We give them crystalloids like we would give a patient who is septic. If after their volume resuscitated, they're still hypotensive, we start with vasoactive medications like epinephrine. We do source control when they get to the hospital and we give antibiotics and we continue to do our normal sort of ongoing assessment of the patient with sepsis. All right, last case and then we're wrapping it up. So the guy has survived literally everything that we've thrown at him, okay? He has survived a suction event, he survived a thrombus, he survived a driveline infection. All right, now we see him again. Call for a seizure. Arrive on scene and the patient is totally unresponsive to all stimuli. You get a set of vitals, you get this heart rate that you're getting him around 36 and that doesn't look good. You put him on the monitor and now it's correlating of a heart rate around the 30s. There's no map that you can get. The pressure cuff just keeps recycling. The patient looks to be apneic. You got that pulse ox on and it's giving the reader on the monitor of like less than 50%, something we hate seeing. And you check a glucose because the patient's altered, or in this case, unresponsive, and it's 98. Okay, on exam, you still hear the motor, no pulses, not breathing, they're pale, and they have cool skin. Their device, low flow alarm, it's about one liter per minute, the speed is low, and the power looks to be okay. All right, so what do you, what do, you do here? Well, patient's mental status, they're unresponsive. Airway is clearly compromised due to their mental status. So you're, again, putting airway adjuncts in and you're bagging the patient because they're not breathing. Circulation, no pulses, can't get it carotid. The, you put them on the monitor and you see this rhythm, this sort of agonally beating, very slow rhythm. When you listen to the LVAD itself, it still is running. Okay, so I have a running LVAD, but I have an unconscious, not breathing, pulseless patient that looks to be in PEA. The drive line looks fine, and you have a low flow alarm. So what do you do here, right? So this patient, unconscious, not breathing, no pulses, poor skin, low flow, the motor's still running, and they're effectively in PEA. So you guessed it, this patient's a cardiac arrest. Well, so what do you do with the patient in cardiac arrest that has an LVAT? Anybody wanna throw something in the chat for me? CPR or no CPR? If one CPR, no CPR, CPR. Somebody's giving me a car, that's cool, I'll take a car. CPR and volume, all right. So here we go. So back in 2017, the American Heart Association finally published a scientific statement on the cardiopulmonary resuscitation of adults and children with mechanical devices. And this was first put into the Journal of Circulation and it really addresses a consensus approach to the management for the unconscious and arresting patient with an LVAD. 
and it relies very heavily on our exam, and at the ALS level, capnography too, to figure out what to do. This was further refined in the Journal of Cardiac Failure in 2019, and this is now sort of the universally accepted algorithm. So the first thing you do is, is you assess the patient, okay? Assess your patient, right? When in doubt, look at the patient. And if they're perfusing adequately, well, they're not in cardiac arrest, right? And you look for other reasons why they're altered, okay? If they're not perfusing adequately, you listen to the device. In this case, you heard a hum. So now you're checking mental status or unresponsive. They're not breathing. They have no pulses. They have a map that's less than 50. You get them intubated. You have the end title on. The end title's 10. You absolutely perform chest compressions. Now, somebody is going to ask me at some point, can I use a Lucas device? And while there is not definitive data on this, my recommendation is you do manual, not mechanical CPR. The reason is this. Sometimes with mechanical devices, you get the thing that we call the Lucas walk, right? Where you put it up here, and then all of a sudden you look and it's sort of down on the xiphoid process. We don't want that. We want manual chest compressions. Okay, so if the patient is in arrest, as defined by a map that you can't get, and certainly one less than 50, an end title of less than 20, they're unconscious, they have no pulse, they're not breathing, you do CPR. Um, this will be outlined for you in the, in the new release of our MIMS protocol starting in July. And we're just gonna have you start CPR. If you wanna consult the base station, you certainly can, but if they meet this criteria, you're gonna start CPR. All right, let's summarize. So, continuous flow LVADs, why are they good? They increase life expectancy. The heart may three, you should expect to see more of, they're becoming probably the most common. Remember that LVAD patients are preload dependent. If they get dehydrated, you run the risk of suction events. They are at a very high risk of bleeding due to being anticoagulated and being on antiplatelet agents. So any minor trauma, take them to a trauma center. Suction events. Remember, they have low circulating volume. They often present with an arrhythmia, specifically ventricular tachycardia. You'll get a low flow alarm. You manage them with IV fluids. Pump thrombus, power surges, right? Remember, never greater than two watts above their baseline and never ever double digits. They're gonna have low flow. In the hospital, we start them on heparin, but in the field, if their pump isn't being adequate, that is when you would consult for hemodynamic support being a vasoactive agent such as epinephrine drip. Drive lines, remember they are a source for sepsis in these patients. Always take a look at it and ask them how their drive line looks. Cardiac arrest, confirm using multiple data points that the patient is unconscious, unresponsive, apneic, no pulses, cool, MAP is poor and end title is poor and you start manual chest compressions. And ultimately remember that no single parameter is a surrogate for the overall clinical picture of your patient. Examine your patient. All right, and as I promised coming soon, this is what it's gonna look like. I'm not gonna release it yet uh, until we have it all set, but we're gonna have a ventricular assist device protocol a MIMS that is going to address suction events and is going to address when to initiate CPR. All right. So with that, uh, it's exactly at the top of the hour. I thank you guys for your attention. Uh, happy to handle any other questions. Let me see. Um, so do you adjust positioning? Nope, positioning is, is as you normally would uh, in, any, in any patient. Good, good question. Is there a modified way to do CPR, a less damaging way? Another good question. Nope, I would just do CPR as you normally would um, with the appropriate rate in depth. Because again, you, you gotta be able to get flow to this patient. Um, people would often use whether or not the motor is running as a determination of whether or not they're gonna do CPR, right? So if the motor's running, I'm not gonna do CPR. But if the motor isn't running, I will do CPR. The reason why you can't use that distinction is because somebody's motor could be running, but it could be running too slow to actually do anything effective for the patient. And that's why they're in cardiac arrest. Um, hospital alerts do not apply for these patients, correct? Yeah, so if the patients, if the hospitals are on red or yellow or reroute, 
Um, no, I mean, the only, the only thing where I could see a hospital alert applying would be mini disaster. Um, but if the hospital is not a mini disaster, I would still consult, honestly, um, to, just to see if they'd be able to take the patient. And this is going back to the patient's hospital, right? That's right. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Wherever the patient gets their care, that's where they need to go. Uh, anything else? I think that we got all. Hey, Sean. Yeah. Yeah, I had one of these one day, and the the the, the backstory was he was not taking his Coumadin because he had a nosebleed, so he decided to stop. He had a type three, and he was uh, clotting off his pump. His hospital was down in D.C. We took him to Hopkins. I don't Bro, know if he would have yeah. made it. I don't know if he would have made it to D.C. Yeah, that's a good point too. But I think for our providers, for sure, getting these facilities on the line and having this discussion, because I could definitely see how that could be a stressful decision in the moment. And yeah, I think these patients are quite complicated and stressful for providers, me included. Yeah. If the hospital doesn't do heart surgery, there's no point in taking them there. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a good point, which is why, you know, Obviously, if there's an impending airway emergency, you, those are the situations where you do divert, right? Because yeah. if you don't have an airway, you're not going to have a patient. But that is really highlights the reason why you got to bring everything. We were involved in a case where an EMS um, system brought a patient to a non VAD center, and the patient did not bring an extra set of batteries. And the hospital, the ED, oh, did not oh. have extra batteries. So I have never seen more panicked residents and like people running around because ultimately we were able to get an ambulance over to Johns Hopkins main campus, throw a couple batteries in the ambulance and have the ambulance go priority to the outside hospital to deliver the batteries. And it was like within minutes, you know, of the patient's device shutting off. It was unbelievable. Wow. That's crazy scary. Uh, somebody asked, is there any special considerations for termination or resuscitation of LVAD patients? No, um, bring, you know, you, you're going to be hard pressed to find a physician over the base station that will allow you to terminate these patients on scene. They'll, they'll have you bring them in. Agree. I think we got all the questions. Uh, oh, I wanted to ask what uh what was patients so remember the the h bad is a type of an l bad it's just the name for it like heart made is a type of l bad and h bad is a type of an l bad um and all patients hearts are going to contribute to some extent the degree to which their heart is contributing could be assessed really two ways one if it's contributing substantially these patients may even have a detectable radial pulse, okay? The other way is when you look at the pulsatility index. Uh, that's another way to sort of figure it out. And patients will tell you if they have a pulse or not. Yeah, <laughs> um, absolutely. There are a couple more questions rolling in too. Can you see this? Is there any, yeah, is there a potential issue with malfunction ACD? Um, yeah, so great question. Almost every single, and I would say every single one, uh, of these patients are going to have an AICD because part of the process of getting to an LVAD generally, I mean, there are, there are always exceptions, generally is getting what we call a BI-V AICD. Um, and that's essentially an AICD and a pacemaker. Um, and that's part of sort of the process of having bad heart failure. So before they get to the LVAD stage, they have a pacemaker and AICD in. There's another question wow. about survival rates after CPR. Uh, what are the survival rates of these patients after cardiac arrest? Uh, generally not good. I don't have a specific number for you. Uh, generally not good, although it sort of depends upon, you know, what the etiology is. If it's a, if it's a fixable thing, right, this is something we can intervene upon uh, better. If it's, you know, just generally, you know, and, and then again, how long they've been sort of in arrest for before 
before they're found uh, would be sort of obviously the, the other thing that, go to, that goes toward it. But generally, you know, the, the cardiac arrest survival rate is really poor in these patients. Stroke incidence. Stroke incidence is generally pretty high here uh, because, again, you're, you're sort of um, having to find that sweet spot between an INR um, and essentially aspirin, but really that INR that does not allow them to clot and basically one that where they're not going to spontaneously bleed into their head. So generally speaking, when these patients have strokes, it tends to be hemorrhagic strokes, which is a, which is a catastrophe because what do we usually do for people that have hemorrhagic strokes and are on anticoagulation? We reverse them. But now you go to reverse the patient with an LVAD, you can clot their LVAD. So uh, a very sort of rock and a hard place uh, to be with these, with these patients. Um, let's see, would... What is the life expectancy of the patient who chooses an LVAD? Okay, so destination therapy. So generally, you know, these patients, if they take care of the device, uh, they remain well anticoagulated, they're not having driveline infections, you know, 12, you know, they say 10 to 12 years, even longer, they really take care of these, of these devices. Would a trauma center would be the best option for the patient receiving CPR due to risk of dislodgement? Not, not necessarily. Um, I, I don't think, you know, generally this, places that take care of VADs are also going to be trauma centers. Um, I guess I guess the exception would be University of Maryland, right? Because shock trauma would be the trauma center. Um, but no, bring them to where their normal hospital is, unless their normal hospital is not a trauma center, in the case of University of Maryland ED. And in that case, if they're a trauma, bring them to shock trauma. Somebody asked if there is a list of all LVAD patients. Generally, jurisdictions uh, do know where their LVAD patients uh, live. Do patients have a manual pump? Uh, good question. Um, nope, not anymore. So back in the day, you know, they there was with the uh, with the pulsatile devices, they had this sort of manual pump. But no, the, these patients are not. They don't have manual pumps anymore. It's a really good question. Is there any routine uh, pacemakers that come with LVADs? Uh, nope. Nope. Usually, again, it's going to be the, bi the biventricular AICD, which is also known as cardiac resynchronization therapy. So the idea before they get an LVAD is to help both of the chambers of their heart beat together to get the most effective contraction possible to help their heart function. Uh, so generally, these patients will have bi-V pacemakers before they get their, uh, before they get their LVAD. Hmm. Yes, these people often come into the firehouses to explain how to care for them. That's awesome. Um, capital Regional. Yep. Oh, oh, PM as a preventative maintenance? No. Um, not, not unless they're doing, you know, they maintain obviously their anticoagulation. The preventative maintenance is, is sort of lab work. You could think about it that way. You know, is there evidence of hemolysis in their labs to suggest maybe a clot is brewing? Are they well anticoagulated as evidenced by their INR? I would think about that as sort of the preventative maintenance. Um, there, there are no oil changes or anything like that, but good question. Somebody asked about, you know, the DNR, can these things be shut off in the field? Is that the question, Coos? Yeah, uh, generally, yeah, generally it's not up to us to unplug, shut these things off. Um, patient has a DNR. We honor their DNR, um, but there's nothing else we would, you know, we're, we're not expecting you guys to go and sort of unplug these devices. How long do the batteries last? So the batteries last, you know, depending on what is going on with the device, the batteries last for, you know, 10, 12 hours. Um, but we, we always sort of obviously bank on them lasting not as long as that. Uh, should, for whatever reason, the battery needs to draw more power, right? Let's say there's a, right, there's a pump thrombus, and now you're drawing a lot more power. Clearly, the battery isn't going to last that long. What's the, uh, what, what level are they anticoagulated? What's their INR range? Yeah, awesome. So um, generally, they're around, again, like two to three-ish, um, but people can have sort of individual parameters. So let's say 
you know, your patient has had a high propensity for clotting, they may run them on a, on a little bit higher to like 3.5. And on the other end of the spectrum, let's say they've had, a, they've had GI bleeds in the past, they may run them on the lower twos or even the, the really, really high ones. Uh, but two to three is sort of a good reference range. And the same goes with aspirin. Um, they're taking anywhere from 81 to 325 milligrams of aspirin, again, sort of balancing the risk of bleeding versus the risk of clotting. Uh, and all of this, the, the patient's going to know and it's going to be specific to them. Uh, Captain Holden should, says dispatch yeah. should flag these patients with their treating hospital, as in they do that or they should? Captain Holden? Usually there's a note. They, they should. There might note. be a note that there's an LVAD patient, but I'm just curious from my own knowledge as to whether they can, would do that. That's something they might consider. Of course, I know we're supposed to have a new CAD coming up, but uh, that might be a good point to have them add their treating facility. Yeah, you, you, you could certainly flag it in CAD, right? And we flag something. Yeah, all that, the time that's what I'm CAD. talking about because yeah. I'm pretty confident that it'll flag that you're going to the address of LVAD patient, but coupled with mm -hmm. that address information would be their treating facility. Yes, fine. Can, yes, it can certainly do. Make, it'll take one of the guesses out of the game for us. Yep, 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 can do. Like, you know, you, you see, you know, EMS has been to this house four times in the last week, right? We'll flag it with that. So I'm sure you could flag it with, with other things as well. I'd love the coordinator's phone number. <laughs> yeah, coordinator's phone number. Um, again, it was this new VAD protocol that you see on the screen that's going to be coming out uh, in okay. July will hopefully be really helpful for you guys. It's going to have the VAD numbers for the coordinator. Uh, the one in Hopkins, we're actually giving you a cell phone number. Uh, they gave us a cell phone number. We'll give you guys a cell phone number. Um, University of Maryland and MedStar. Cool. These patients yeah. usually carry that information in that little pouch next to their batteries. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For sure, so. for sure. But you know, the day is going to come when like, there's going to be no care partner, the patient's not going to know where their stuff is, and they're having an acute emergency. And you're like, N -n now what do I do? Dr. Margolis, I was going to say that as well. We had a patient at Hopkins that never carried his stuff, and he had never changed his lifestyle. So he's been caught out there without the battery. So it can happen. Yep. Yep. 